it does is just um, and she did her PhD on fusarium head blight. And then for the last six or seven years, she's been working at RHS Wisley. And uh, one of the main things which she researches is our malaria honey fungi, or, or, or all the British honey fungi, I guess. And she's doing some particularly interesting work uh, because she's working in an urban environment. That's very different than anything that's been done before. So she's doing some very nice stuff there. And maybe she'll touch upon that a little bit tonight, although I know that she's going to tell us uh, very much more. Uh, as well as research and things in the garden in general, she also does quite a lot of outreach and I I'm delighted that she's embarking on a, a lot of citizen science and outreach now and, uh, and really spreading the word. Um, so welcome to you Jazzy. Um, Jazzy is going to tell us about fungi that harm and heal trees and gardens. Uh, you don't know what you've got until you've lost it, which is so true of very many things. So if I, if I ask you to share your screen now and uh, everybody, if you'd like to put questions in the chat as we go along, we should have plenty of time at the end uh, to have those questions answered by Jazzy. Um, we must, however, finish by nine o'clock. So over to you then, Jazzy. Thank you very much, Lynn, and thank you, Sally, and the whole British Mycological Society for having me. Um, and hello to all of you in the audience. Um, I've seen a few familiar names, um, so hopefully none of this is too repetitive, but I am going to cover quite a range of topics. Um, but yeah, what I think kind of hinges it all together, as Lynn said, is this idea that, yeah, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Um, and uh, yeah, so fungi is the focus, but it won't just be the harmful ones, despite the fact I am a plant pathologist. Uh, my work has now spanned into beneficials as well. And as Lynn said, <clears throat> at the Royal Horticultural Society, my remit uh, is all within gardens um, and particularly the trees within gardens. But <clears throat> I didn't start out that way. I started off, as I said, researching, as Lynn said, um, agricultural disease, fusarium head blight of wheat. Um, and that's really how I kind of started thinking about plant pathology is that there are all these massive crop diseases, really huge yield impacts and global impacts. Um, and perhaps this is how you're most familiar with plant pathogens as well. Um, so I thought I'd just give a quick overview of a few of those before I then segue into some of the fungi that are pathogens of trees. Well, Fusarium head blight to start with, um, this is a fungus that it is caused by a whole complex of different fungi within the Fusarium genus. Um, and it doesn't just affect wheat, it can affect barley, it can affect corn. Um, and it will either cause symptoms on the ears and reduce the, the grain yield directly. Uh, this is one of my experimental plants that's been kept so humid, it's really fluffed up with fungi, um, with mycelium in between the spikelets of the wheat plant. But you can see they've gone brown and bleached. Um, and the grain are not just shriveled and lower in quality. They're also uh, impregnated with toxins, mycotoxins, which indirectly will lower the economic value of that grain. So this is quite a severe problem. Um, and the fusaria can also cause diseases at different stages of the wheat's life cycle, including a foot rot and a seedling blight as well. So very troublesome customers. Uh, another big wheat disease, and I think the biggest wheat disease in terms of economic value in the UK winter wheat is septoria leaf blotch. So this um, this picture here shows some leaf lesions. So it mainly affects um, the fo foliage of the crop, reducing its photosynthetic capacity and then having a knock on effect to having a lower yield. But it can also affect grain directly. And this one is really notorious for picking up fungicide resistance. So in order to try and control this, a, you need to have a kind of combined approach, an integrated approach using varietal resistance um, and in combination with specific fungicides as well as cultural controls. Um, but year by year, uh, it's a very big challenge to try and um, overcome. Then we've got some diseases that are less relevant for the UK, but are really enormous globally. So coffee rust, um, so these are, instead of the other two, like ascomycete fungi, this is a basidiomycete. And with most rusts, you have an alternative host, but the alternative host for this, is, if it exists, is not known, hasn't been found. Um, and it's very difficult to get this under control. Um, there's two different rust fungi that uh, occur in different geographic regions. Um, 
So there's H Coffee and Cola, um, and I forget the name of the other one. I have written it down though. Um, and one of which is kind of more broad scale, and then another one which is sort of geographically isolated. Uh, so yeah, the, the Hemalia vestatrix is what occurs all over the coffee growing regions of the world, whereas Coffee and Cola is restricted to higher altitude regions in Africa. But both of these species affect, affect lots of different coffee species, including the most economically important ones, Arabica and Robusta. And if coffee is the most important agricultural product in international trade in terms of monetary value, coffee rust is therefore the most economically important disease in the world, um, if, if, because it certainly is the most economically important disease of coffee. Um, and then lastly, almost a tree disease, but a disease of a palm, uh, we have the Panama wilt of banana. So we've had different rounds of epidemics of Panama wilt throughout history, but the current problematic strain um, is this is another Fusarium, but Fusarium oxysporum, uh, former Specialis cubensi, tropical race four. Um, and this is threatening the ubiquitously grown Cavendish banana, and there aren't any chemicals that are effective to control it. Once you start getting into trunk based diseases and you know thick tissues trying to get any kind of chemical to have an impact on those tissues you immediately have a big physical barrier to doing that uh, whereas if you could spray something effective against these foliar pathogens you might have a chance of of reducing the future yield loss if you catch it at the right stage in its biology but tree fungi once it's in that stem you're really going to struggle to get it out um, and yeah, so this transmission occurs in the banana through the xylem, so up, upwards and downwards, um, translocated through that sort of stem. Um, and therefore, trying to stop the xylem being able to pass that fungus on is a target for trying to breed for new genetic resistance. And I think this is one crop that when I was doing my PhD, uh, we, we used to talk about being people might actually start accepting the need for case by case elegant uh, use of genetic engineering or editing uh, in order to introduce those traits because people love bananas, people love their coffee against these things. If that's our only route to being able to solve the problems, maybe that will finally tip, tip the, the balance in favour of using these technologies in an elegant way rather than the European traditional approach of a complete moratorium. However, Brexit seems to have kind of thrown things uh, like allowed a new throw of the dice in the UK anyway. So moving on to fungi as tree pathogens. Um, again, some of these epidemics are very famous um, and maybe some of you have got some very personal experiences seeing the loss of these trees um, over the you know, several last last several decades. Dutch elm disease um, caused a uh, enormous losses, billions of trees were lost. Let me check how many I've written this down. No, nope, I didn't write out uh, how many trees were lost with Dutch elm disease. Um, but this is a kind of, it's an interesting one because it requires a combination of factors in order to initiate the disease. So young trees won't be affected by the pathogen until they reach a certain diameter, after which point some beetles, bark beetles will move in and it cause these galleries underneath the bark. And as they do so, both bring with them and allow kind of these fungi to establish inside the galleries. Um, yeah, these of Ophiostoma novo ulmi uh, fungi in order to colonize that trunk and then start causing the damage, um, preventing water transport up the plant and leading to die back in the plant. And you'll see the staining inside the wood um, in the bottom uh, left hand panel. Um, but yeah, so we don't have a lot of elms. If we do have elms, they tend to be quite small. Um, and it's it's a real shame. It's completely altered the landscape. I'm not very familiar with elm trees because I haven't really grown up around them. There was so many that have already been gone. But I have grown up around ash trees and ash dieback um, reached the UK in 2012 and is estimated to eventually be killing off 80% of the ash trees that have been in the UK previously. Uh, it's obviously a devastating change to our landscapes as well. Some of these symptoms um, are visible at the kind of the branching points, the nodes around the branches have these diamond shaped lesions, as well as um, kind of blackened shepherd's crooks at the ends. Um, and yeah, eventually it's a, both of these are lethal diseases of the trees. And 
we're finding little pockets of resistance and hoping to be able to save the ash and repopulate these things. But with any tree that dies, we're looking at all the other organisms that depend on that tree. When we start thinking about tree pathogens, we start about thinking about something that is an entire holobiont, a really powerful organism within its ecosystem, much more so than something that we're growing just for its grain yield, just for its coffee yield in a, in a monoculture. Um, well, I mean, yeah, so it's not that coffees aren't supporting other things anyway, but these are integrated within our woodlands, within our urban landscapes. Um, so the effects of losing these trees uh, goes much beyond just yield losses. Um, so but these are also our native trees, um, the first two. Uh, we also have problems with the conifer trees that we plant for economically important processes like timber production. Um, so a, an important pine disease is Dothi Dothistroma red band needle blight. And some of the symptoms are shown in this photo here, um, where the bandings begins on the needles. Um, it starts off pale, it becomes red, and then those needles will drop off. And it's only the most kind of recently affected new needles at the end that eventually remain. And you get what we call this lion's tail symptom with a completely bare branch and then a little tuft of needles at the end. And because this has been so um, widespread throughout our conifer plantations, I think there was a survey in 2006 in Britain of pine stands and 70% of those pine stands were found to have the infection and with just under half of those stands displaying infection of at least 30% of the crown. So really significant because you don't have needles, you don't have a high rate of photosynthesis and you see when you do a transect of the trunk that those growth rings are getting narrower and narrower and narrower and the growth of that tree is just slowly grinding to a halt and eventually the trees will die. So there's been a shift um, towards growing other conifer species, um, such as larch and firs, and hemlocks, spruces, because they're not so badly affected by this disease. But the Corsican pine was a really promising pine tree that we could have kept growing as our climate became more Mediterranean and, and uh, under drier conditions and hotter conditions. So that's a real shame that something that was being sort of future proofed for our timber production uh, has been sort of taken off the agenda because of this disease. But uh, yes, there are, we are getting not just so, I think most of those, those diseases there, they arrived in the UK um, from elsewhere. And that's, this is part of the problem with our tree diseases. It, we're, we're seeing pathogens on the move. And the reason why we're seeing this happening more and more is because of the sheer volume of global trade um, and, and international travel. So you're getting high speed rail networks that can connect Asia to Europe in just a matter of hours and uh, like they're sort of East Asia. And with that, the demand to inspect and protect any cargo uh, just becomes well, it's not impossible, but like it, it's, it, it's, it's very difficult to really catch everything. It's unlikely that we'll ever be able to catch everything. Um, and it's the unknown unknowns. It's the things that we don't understand the impact that they will have until they get here. And then they start causing absolute havoc um, on the trees that we have. Um, and we don't just need to think about what kind of level of damage do they create once they do arrive. It's also what level of damage will they do as our climate keeps changing? So the trees that we have, they're already in place. You know, we're not, we can't replace them quickly. Those trees themselves are going to have to adapt to that climate and probably be under greater stress. And any plant under stress is much more vulnerable to attack from both pests and diseases. Um, so it does, well, there's really not a lot going for us in terms of um, if we sort of sit back and do nothing and kind of keep the systems as they are and keep the trade practices as they are, um, that gives us great hope that our trees will be safe for future generations. We will be able to, able to depend on them as timber crops and as wonderful sanctuary spaces for us as humans, as well as all of the ecosystem services that they provide in terms of carbon capture, flood mitigation, so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, we're also not helping ourselves in terms of land degradation and a lot of our plantations have, like the crops, been planted as monocultures as well. And with low stand diversity, this enables pathogens to just run rampant through those through those stands, where whilst mixed plantings would be a lot more successful at minimising the amount of damage any one kind of outbreak could cause. 
Um, but yeah, so we're seeing increased establishment and then increased impact that these diseases, as well as pests uh, that do arrive newly in Europe, are having. And yes, as I said, it isn't just our planted forests, it's our natural forests as well. Um, and I think we're a lot more kind of attached and fond of our native trees. And in terms of the eco, uh, the, the number of organisms that associate with our, our native trees, uh, we would expect those to be much more complex, um, much higher sort of diversity of organisms that depend on them because of the long evolutionary process. Um, and so that in terms of their value as like a, a, an anchor within that ecosystem, our native trees are really um, important for us to try and protect. And so to observe any changes to them as, as quickly as we can, and I'll explain more about why timing is key uh, soon. Um, but yeah, likewise with both natural and planted forests, this is an issue not just of our rural locations, it's also our, our urban settings, but people are attached to those trees for very different reasons. And just to put it in perspective, this is a bit of a scary number that six new organisms that affect uh, trees uh, arrive in Europe each year. Um, so that's really quite quite high. If you just sort of think about like how many years back was the pandemic, how many new organisms have arrived since then? Uh, it doesn't mean that everyone is going to be a new lethal epidemic causing organism, but that really shows the scale of the pressure that these plants are under. So. Um, I was involved in a, a project called Project HOMED, which uh, stands for the Holistic Management of Emerging and Invasive Forest Pests and Diseases, uh, funded by uh, an EU Horizon 2020 grant um, for four years. And this was a very large consortia um, of 23 organisations spanning 15 countries. And the RHS was one of two UK partners um, and Coventry University was the other. So within this, this is an enormous project. It has lots of um, work packages breaking down lots of different kind of aspects of how can we protect our forests? How can we understand more about these emerging threats? Um, and it really achieved a phenomenal amount and had very high praise after its audit. Um, but I want to kind of walk you through a couple of bits that, as I say, the RHS was involved in. Um, and yeah, talk a little bit about the sort of tree health uh, stakeholders. So we've just had this paper published. Uh, Sam Green is the lead author and it's been published in Neobiota. Um, and yeah, it was basically an online survey of tree health stakeholders. And so these stakeholders could range from forest health authorities and policymakers to people that carried out surveys. Uh, or they gave advice on what problems people were encountering, um, as well as people that just owned and managed the land containing trees and forests, um, scientists that were engaging in research, as well as civil society, because anyone that looks at and loves a tree um, has a stake in its health and its future. So if you're unfamiliar with plant pathology, um, you may be unfamiliar with this invasion curve as well, particularly biosecurity issues. Um, this basically shows how over time the area of infested uh, like planting cover, tree cover, um, goes up sort of exponentially and then eventually sort of tops out. And the time in which you could carry out some kind of mitigation, we sort of split it into chunks. So if the pest or disease, I'm just going to say disease from here on in because we did cover both pests and diseases, but in terms of fungi, we're talking about diseases. Um, so if the fungus or the disease has not yet arrived in your country, your best bet is to try and keep it out to prevent it from arriving. And that means screening any any products that are coming in by trade, um, carrying out regular inspections of key sites, um, having really good biosecurity practices. So you would pick up things that came in um, and having a good paper trail. So if something does come in, uh, you can stop it from coming in any further and you can trace back all those ones that have gone out into the wider population and remove them so it hasn't actually escaped. Um, but then in order to know that it's arrived you need to be able to detect it. So that means there's a level that has entered the country um, but detection could range from visual identification to using an electronic nose to pick up a volatile signature that then cues you in that it's there to taking samples like you know stem samples boring into the stem and carrying out a, a quick rapid diagnostic process using dna markers um, 
yet or it deters, you don't detect it until it gets further down the line hopefully it's been quarantined for some time before it comes in and and then when you see the development of symptoms so it's not a direct sign it's the symptoms of that and then someone gets called in that has a proper inspection then you really do non-rapid but you know lab based assessments to see if you can find out what things are um, and again because a lot of these things they look very similar to harmless organisms um, and you don't know just how much of an impact it will have if it is something unknown and un, un, untested uh, but yeah those detection methods we really were quite lacking in a lot of that and so a lot of labs spent a, some really good uh, time researching and developing new tools for better detection strategies for a lot of our highest risk pests and pathogens during this project HOMED. But at all those stages, you've got quite a good chance of stopping the problem um, from really costing you a lot of money. But uh, once it really starts establishing in the country and popular uh, and, and multiplying and the, and the area investor just keeps rising and rising into that logarithmic phase, then you're attempting to eradicate something that is trying to spread. So it's really a battle against time. Um, but after a while, you may lose that battle. It's quite likely once it's sort of gotten out. Um, and if you think about things like the oak processionary moth uh, that, that started off in the kind of London area and it's sort of slowly spreading out and out and we're not trying to eradicate that anymore. Uh, we've just been trying to contain it. We're trying to prevent moving oak trees around. Uh, we've accepted that we're probably not going to be able to eradicate it. We're mitigating the damage and trying to prevent it from spreading further. Um, or prevent it from causing as much harm as possible, uh, which is when you move into the it's there, it's pretty much everywhere. We're just trying to manage and mitigate that damage, which is yeah, often where we end up. It's quite unlikely that we manage successful eradication attempts. But some examples from the pest side of things are things like the uh, the Asian longhorn beetle, uh, which cost a lot of money, but was successfully eradicated in the UK. Um, and yeah, so again, this time factor is really, really important. The earlier you can notice something, the better the chance that you can actually prevent it from taking root in the country, establishing and causing the enormous amount of damage that is potentially on the table. So we did this survey um, with those groups, as I said, um, and we wanted to find out about their awareness of some high risk uh, pests and pathogens and on average people were correctly knowledgeable about eight out of 18 of this high risk list which is uh, those on the bottom of the graph on the right hand side sorry they're all in latin i could have should probably put those in common names as well but you'll see not a lot of them are actual fungi or diseases at all but fusarium uh, circinatum is one um yeah, there's not a lot, is there? There's was, was a full 18. Um, and I think Heteroposidion is also on there as well, actually, as was Ash Dieback. But, uh, but yeah, so people were about less than half um, of the group were they actually correct to know that they were aware of it and that whether or not it was genuinely in their country or not. But what was interesting is that people tended to be more correct in their knowledge when something wasn't in the country compared to things that were. So I think there's a lot of successful work going on to raise awareness around the things that we want to prevent coming in. And people know that they're not here yet. And that's why we want to be on top of it to try and prevent it from getting out. Um, then the things that are here, um, yeah, people might not be quite so aware of, um, except for some of the really big names. So we've had so much attention on some of those massive epidemics because uh, the most knowledge that people had did tend to be around Ash dieback was its best known pathogen. Um, in fact, best known out of, of, of all the um, all of the different uh, pests and pathogens tried, whilst Heteroposidion root rot was the least well uh, well known. Um, but also, but in general, people were more aware of insect pests. So it shows that we have got a job to do as fungal uh, in people with fungal interests and scientists in order to educate for some of these more kind of cryptic uh, difficult to identify um, yeah less high profile but these are still very important 
uh, organisms and we yeah we want people to be to be aware of them especially those that have this direct link um, to be to being able to report problems as they emerge and as they arrive uh, with stakeholder roles such as managers and owners of woodlands also unsurprisingly i suppose people that had a scale of their work at the national level tended to be more correct um, about which uh, pests and pathogens were present or not whilst those at the local level uh, had presumably more awareness over what was present in their local area but they weren't really thinking nationally um, and whether or not that's something that we need to address as communicators um, is uh, something to kind of think about for future risk mitigation strategies. We wanted to know what tools are used for both management and for uh, detecting and identifying the pests and pathogens. Um, with the ID tools on the left, you can see the things that they used the most were things like publications and policies and referring to experts. But then there were certain things that were really in fact, a lot of these tools were underused and we could do a lot more to maximise our ability to contain these problems and identify these problems. Um, if we develop these systems more. So things like social media, citizen science, modelling where things are expected to go so we can target our efforts better is really key. And even getting more technologically advanced. So capitalising on the smartphone that everyone has in their pocket and using some clever apps that combine modelling, tracking, reporting and information so people have a really easy job of finding the information they need and signalling up the scale to get anyone down to come and have a look and do some proper testing if something new has appeared. Um, things like sentinel plantings, if you're not familiar with this concept, I think it's just such a lovely idea and it is, can be very effective. The idea is you, you plant trees from a distant part of the world and you see whether the pests and pathogens that are present in your country, um, what they would do to those trees. And so we might have sentinel plantings in other places and see what of those native organisms uh, are going to pose a threat to some of the trees if they were to reach our country. And likewise, we have sentinels in the UK where these are monitored much more closely. Um, and again, if anything is kind of emerging on there, it's just a good first point of call um, to kind of raise the flag. We don't have to look at every single tree, uh, but yeah, they kind of raise the awareness. And so we can take some interventions as early as possible and minimise the damage. But yeah, things like um, drones is also another interesting one because that could be both used to identify and detect with these interesting sensors, either by remote sensing and picking up on like infrared signatures because disease trees, they tend to transpire less and they tend to be hotter. So they'll show up differently under an infrared spectrum, um, but also they could be used to manage. So you can not just have sensing drones, but also, for instance, spraying drones, be that spraying chemicals or biologicals. Um, but yeah, in terms of what tools people were using to manage, um, chemical controls were not being used, but biologicals were also still underused and that physical controls and tree disposal tended to be used the most in addition to just following the policies. But it does show that people do follow the policies and the policy needs to lead on this, um, as I do believe they are. We've got a new biosecurity strategy from the UK that's just been released this year. But we didn't just ask them about the now, we also asked them about what next. Um, and some of these fungi, in fact, the, the, the top four like diseases that came up were all fungal diseases. So things like oak wilt and chestnut blight, plain wilt and tip and blight canker um, of pine all came up um, as being repeatedly said. And they were not just said from the UK, it was people from France, Netherlands, Switzerland, uh, is that, the, is that the Czech Republic? So yeah, so it's an old name and as well as the UK and as northernly as, as Sweden. So these are Europe wide concerns. And yeah, there were also another 13 fungi where one person from different countries um, all, all said those. So fungal pathogens are of concern there. We, as I said, the issues of once they're in, trying to get rid of them, trying to control their spread um, is is really key. Um, but as I say, we won't just talk about the harmful ones um, and most of these they cause such damage because they're being introduced from elsewhere. A lot of our um, fungi that do cause diseases within trees within our country, they're unlikely, they, they, they've sort of established a balance. They'll be 
withdrawing some of the trees and, and some of the yield, but they're not killing everything in sight. Um, and actually, while it's a problem in a case by case scenario, it's not a problem for wiping out whole swathes of trees and yeah, having these massive generational effects. But these were some of the tools, as you can see, that uh, people wanted more of. Unsurprisingly, it is mostly things that were underused anyway. Um, but then things like the posters, like we do already have posters, but we can do a lot better to strategize where they are, what they say, how they are how they can be really easy to use and, and be really nice and catchy. Um, uh, and it shows, yeah, you don't always have to reinvent the wheel to do something really powerful for people. And hopefully um, there are people creating these campaigns can draw on this research to inform their future communication strategies. Um, things like biosecurity practices, um, it might sound a bit vague. So when we talk about biosecurity, we're talking about preventing pests and pathogens moving around um, and entering new places. And in order to do that, practices involve things like quarantine, cleaning, hygiene, disposing of contaminating material safely, um, as well as you know, having all these information sources really available and being able to confidently identify what you found. So it's quite a catch all phrase, but having steps that are actually practical, people can implement um, is is still a kind of is, is a desire. It's it's is a pipe dream. It's it's still very complicated. Um, it's not very clear on any one site what people should be doing. Um, so, yeah, people are like kind of c consulting um, and paying people to kind of develop their biosecurity practices. But we are going through the motions and we're really in the UK. We're kind of leading the way in terms of, of Europe and biosecurity. Um, and we're creating things like the plant healthy scheme for nurseries, uh, as well as doing Europe wide communication um, strategies to try and tell people not to risk traveling uh, with you know, plant material that hasn't been inspected and cracking down, although it does cost a lot of money within the plant trade sector, cracking down on paperwork so you can follow a paper trail of where anything has come from and preventing the movement of very large trees which have an enormous root ball and have all of these organisms that are, are impossible to detect um, until they're on site somewhere else and you don't know what you've released. But yeah, in terms of as scientists, we, we are fully aware just how damaging over-reliance on chemical control methods is. Um, but there is actually like an equal desire to get new, new control methods that were physical, chemical and biological. Um, whereas, yeah, I feel like in the media, biological controls, they've had some kind of cases where things have been uh, kind of, they've caused almost as much damage, it seems, as what they were trying to control. Um, but actually, it just shows that people are short of options and they're kind of they'll be happy to try anything um, as long as it works. So um, another element of Project HOMED uh, was all about developing best practice around citizen science, because as we saw, that was one of the tools that people wanted to see developed through this survey. And uh, yeah, we have got some excellent citizen science in the UK. So the UK partners really kind of championed this and, and led on it. And between Coventry and the RHS, we launched a project called Checker Sweet Chestnut. Um, the benefits of using citizen science is that if you can do something that is mass participation, that is an enormous number of boots on the ground and pairs of eyes paying close attention to trees. But then also, through citizen science, people get a reward themselves. This isn't just passive data collection. This rewards them and it makes them feel like they are connected with their local kind of trees in their community. Um, and being in and around trees is good for people. Um, they usually report a great a sense of well-being and feeling like they're doing something to help. Seeing all their ash trees die and there's very little they can do to help um, is quite disheartening. But then seeing that there's other problems in other trees and they can try and be part of the solution to get ahead of the curve with these other new problems. Um, yeah, makes them feel like there is hope after all. Um, and people have got the tools to do it now. We can take photos of anything and get GPS locations of those photos with you know very little thinking involved. And yeah, we want basically to prepare for the next big outbreak, the next ash dieback. Um, and 
there are some threatening organisms that are already could be that, but hopefully they will be less well suited to the British climate and would not just yeah run rampant uh, quite so badly as 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 Hymenophraxis um, did. So we chose wheat chestnut, um, and uh, it is not a native, but it is an honorary native. Um, it's there's written records of it from the 12th century, but it's thought to potentially have arrived with the Romans for nut production. Um, and it occurs both rurally and in urban areas. It's a very popular street and park tree. And sometimes it is grown as like a as a in for its timber and it's, it's particularly its long straight poles for fencing and hot poles. Uh, nearly 30,000 hectares of it um, as dominated uh, sweet chestnut woodland in the UK. And they are very long lived trees. So they can live up to 700 years. And some of these are really important in our historic landscapes. And we have yeah, more than a thousand trees uh, with over six meters in girth. So once you start to get to these, these ancient levels, that's when you're getting these enormous benefits of I think about all the different organisms that would associate with that tree um, and why we really don't want to lose them. We don't really grow a lot of nuts here, but in Europe there are a lot of nut orch orchards for chestnuts. Um, and the problem is it's under attack from a number of different pests and diseases. Um, so yeah, just a brief segue into tree ID. We are talking about the sweet chestnut rather than the horse chestnut. I uh, probably don't need to say much more than that. So these are the edible chestnuts rather than the play fighting conkers and the leaves are very different. They're not palmate like this, they're individual leaves and they're long and they're glossy. Um, and yeah, that's a quick brief overview of what they kind of look like in detail. Uh, they're much fluffier, uh, kind of uh, cases around the nuts but they're still spiky but a lot denser in the spines and when they get mature the bark is just beautiful it spirals up the tree and it's got this sort of silvery purple sheen to it um, so these are the problems that it's being affected by that we want people to uh, report back to us um, so whilst this project was launched for Project HOMED, we ran it for two years. We had a great success. We had 350 trees added to the map of trees. Um, and we, we caught some of these problems about around 12 times. This year, on the back of National Plant Health Week, DEFRA and Forest Research, basically a consortium of UK partners, wanted to relaunch this project and call on the public again to support ch sweet chestnut trees by going out checking your sweet chestnut and sending in any, in any records of healthy trees as well as trees if they spot either of these two problems. So pay close attention. Here's your quick introduction to checking a sweet chestnut. If you love trees and you know where any are near you, sweet chestnuts, please do submit a record. Um, but the two problems in particular we're looking out for, hopefully you'll find a healthy tree. Um, one, look, the first one is a fungal disease called sweet chestnut blight caused by Cryphonectria parasitica. It's really quite a fascinating fungus, um, and but it is a very harmful one. And it arrived in Europe from Asia. It was introduced in the 1900s. It also arrived in North America at a similar time. And in North America, the American chestnut, which is not Castanea sativa, I forget what Castanea it is, but they're pretty much all been wiped out, or at least the above ground parts of the trees all died back down, some of the roots survived. But in terms of the value of that tree to service the environment and to produce nuts and timber was just lost. Uh, and this is in the billions. So estimated between 3.5 and 4 billion sweet chestnut trees in America prior to the outbreaks and then virtually none today. In the UK though, we didn't find this disease until 2011 uh, and it came in from Kent. Often we find new things in Kent. It's, you know, it's our neighbour with, with Europe. Um, and this is an example of a notifiable disease. So if it is found, it is your kind of civic duty to, to report it. Um, and it's regulated, meaning that people getting those um, re records will take it seriously and carry out site inspections. And because of the damage it caused in America, we're treating this very seriously as a threat to the UK. And what happens to the trees is these spores get in usually through wound sites, um, uh, they infect throughout the, the bark and the trunk, causing staining underneath the bark. And then as the bark kind of cracks and disfigures, uh, eventually these fruiting bodies, the sort of the orange little pustules you can see, 
uh, burst, burst through the bark and under wet and humid condition will release more spores, which again carry on the cycle to infect more wounds. But you may think, you know, are we getting that many wounded trees? How, how easy is it to wound? Well, you can get them just through a leaf scar or, you know, a branch scar or things like this. But also we have other organisms such as the oriental chestnut gall wasp, which is um, causing extra wound sites, enabling fungi like sweet chestnut blight to potentially get in. So this one, I think, is more likely that you'll find it. Um, I'm hoping that people don't find the sweet chestnut bite because that's really bad news that it's, if it is spreading around. Uh, whereas the gall wasp is something that we've sort of accepted is here at least, but we don't know where it is. Um, it's definitely here in the southeast of the UK, but how far it's got to and how quickly it's spreading are big questions to answer. It's a very small wasp, just a couple of millimeters across, but when it lays its eggs in the leaves, this when really it causes these galls to form, which are swellings, and inside there the larvae grow and eventually will turn the gall brown and bust out through an exit hole in the middle of the summer. Um, again, it was found in Kent, <laughs> this time in 2015, and it's another regulated notifiable pest, but less action is taken around finding it. We just really want to map it and know where it is. Um, and again, we want to know what this link is with chestnut blight and whether we're finding chestnut blight in places with this or if they're kind of carrying out separate, separate sort of lifestyles and epidemiologies. Um, but yes, yeah, so please have a look. Um, if you do want to check a sweet chestnut, this is what you need to do carry out good biosecurity so don't go bringing you know if you've got if you're coming from a sweet chestnut area and you think you know you might have sweet chestnut blight there uh, you know don't go bringing your dirty boots into another sweet chestnut area and being one of these vectors to move things around so cleaning your boots is always a good idea um, not just for sweet chestnut blight but other pathogens as well and bring your smartphone and then yeah go and find some trees ideally on public land or your own. If you don't know where any are, you can, Treeszilla is a really lovely uh, website and app uh, where we, it's called the monster map of trees in the UK. So yeah, you can search for where your local trees are and add any trees of any species if you want to get into this um, yourself. And then you can go and see if they need a little checkup. And when you're having a look, really just looking in very close detail at as much of it as you can possibly see. So looking at that trunk and the canopy, is the canopy full for that time of year or like on the right hand tree, is it actually quite sparse and a bit stag's horny? Um, if you can see any lower hanging leaves, are there any malformations? Can you see if they've been disfigured or galled like the gall wasp? And if you can't, if there's nothing really low down, you might see just the way that the leaves fall against the sky doesn't look quite right. Um, and that might indicate that there's some of these disfiguring galls going on in there. Or you might have a, a look at the leaf litter and see if you can see any of the galls that have fallen down. But yeah, if you do find anything, the way to submit a record is through the national reporting platform, Tree Alert. So if you find one of the problems, you're submitting a general report selecting 2023 Checker Sweet Chestnut as the project. But if you find nothing, which hopefully we will find nothing most of the time, you submit a healthy tree report and absence records are just as important as positive records in terms of the scientists that are tracking this, being able to uh, effectively deploy management techniques um, and to understand the biology and how quickly and important these diseases and pests are in the UK. So you've got until November to do that before they'll close the project again. Um, and but yeah, these are the sort of things that you'd be looking for throughout the year. Uh, right now, the leaves are out. I've seen some galls, so you're already looking at galls. Um, but you might not, as as the leaves develop, it can be harder to see, you know, the trunk and the branches of the tree and whether they've been disfigured. But you would see if there's a severe infection of the blight. Um, that the crown would be sparse. So if you've got a sparse crown, start having a look. Maybe you even need binoculars if you're really suspicious of a tree to see if you can spot any of the symptoms um, of sweet chestnut blight. Um, and yeah, but towards later in the summer, you might see the, the galls that have turned brown because the wasps have escaped and they're off laying their eggs uh, ready for next year. Uh, but over winter time, even if the trees have lost their leaves um, and the, you know, might not find any galls anymore, again, looking back at that 
those branches and those trunks to see those those sweet chestnut blight lesions and whatever you do just take as good of photos as you can um, nice and close as close as you can and then the plant health authorities at forest research will be very grateful to go and investigate further and uh, collect those records so i think i talked quite for quite a long time about that but i'm just going to whiz you through some happier news i guess or some things that are more like closer to home so these are all trees um, that we're talking about of massive economic value uh, or huge environmental value because they're in our natural landscapes but closer to home in terms of garden trees the rhs it, we have a top 10 diseases um, every year and this last year out of the top 10 i mean these are the top hosts that we saw diseases on and while they're not all you know kind of forestry trees and woodland trees you can see there's a lot of fruit trees in here and woody shrubs so still long-lived plants um, and very popular plants but they're also under attack and there's a lot of different problems that uh, are being faced by these trees and so if you do have any of these plants in your garden and you're unfamiliar with which problems they get I'm just going to do a quick whistle stop tour of the fungi within the top 10 um, that are harming garden plants but we don't see these as massive threats we see these as threats that damage the vigour of a plant on a variable basis depending on the weather each year and while we don't have definitive evidence we suspect that some of these might worsen over the, as our climate changes uh, whereas other others of them might slowly ebb away um, because they do rely heavily on different environmental factors as with most fungi you'll be aware require quite a high level of moisture uh, but certain fungi can get away with with less and will actually thrive when a host is drought stressed so it's uh, it's, it's not a clear cut trend for all fungal pathogens but we yeah, are we're tracking them over time so number 9 we really don't really think of this as a disease at all number equal ninth within the top 10 pear rust we also could kind of describe it as a bit of biodiversity within the garden um, it affects pears but and the alternative host is juniper and we try and actually educate people to embrace these goals and say your tree will still produce leaves your tree will still produce fruit um, unless it's extremely heavily affected and actually you can see them as quite beautiful structures um, you know they're adding an extra layer of color above and a structure below um, but yeah so we tell people to tolerate this uh, because it's impossible to remove all the alternative junipers um, the, the spores can travel a long way on the wind um, and pruning out the leaves as they become infected is going to overall do more harm than good to the tree. Um, it's like you removing those leaves will reduce the photosynthetic area by a greater amount than just the amount that the fungus is kind of parasitizing off of the tree. Um, whereas apple and pear canker, we would say this is worth trying to prune out and this will just sort of get worse and worse each year if you don't prune it out. Cankers are what we call lesions in wood caused by pathogens uh, that disfigures the wood and prevents it from translocating its water and nutrients as effectively. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is caused by Neonectria um, fungi and hygiene really comes into play here in gardens, which is something that people may not think that much about. But you as fungi people will fully appreciate uh, the power of spores um, to infect and to move around organisms which may not be visible to the naked eye, but are very potent sources of uh, like reproductive structures. So if you're cutting or pruning your tree and you're not cleaning those tools but moving between trees, one which has the disease and one which doesn't, or you're just leaving infected wood around, enabling it to sporulate and just carry on, you know, adding those spores to the local environment. Um, yeah, you're, you're, you're not going to get that disease under control and you're probably adding to the problem by creating new wounds and enabling more spores to be produced. So, yeah, using good hygiene practices within the garden is really key to minimising the impact of some of these particularly woody um, infecting fungi. Yeah, apple and pear scab, another kind of similar situation. It's uh, the control is all around pruning and cleaning up leaves in the autumn time there is some scope that some apples and pears have been bred to be more resistant against apple and pear scab uh, which is caused by the venturia species um, 
But uh, yeah, ultimately, this one isn't just about the health of the tree. It also is going to distort and disfigure your crop, but it doesn't tend to go deep into those fruits. So you can often use a lot of the produce anyway. They just don't look very nice. Silver leaf. Um, now, this one is quite an interesting one. I think I get excited when I see it because it produces these beautiful fruit bodies uh, with a bright purple colour on the bark. But what it does inside the wood is um, send sort of toxins through the wood and it causes a staining inside. And when those toxins reach the leaves, it gets the name silver leaf because the epidermis of the leaf separates from the rest of the mesophyll. And you get like a silvery sheen. Um, but with this, um, yeah, preventing wounding and not pruning at a time when rain splash can help spread those spores around um, is really important. But unless you have the fruit bodies out, the spores are probably not going to be there in great abundance. So it's about timing, timing your pruning so that the wounds heal really quickly in, in like peak, peak summer. Um, but yeah, if you wait until the autumn time when the, the fruit bodies are out, you've really missed your window and you're going to make life worse for yourself if you start pruning at that point in time. Another fruit disease, as I said, this is the mainly fruit diseases, um, is brown rot. So these are the monolinear fungi. Uh, again, you'll see it's mostly cultural controls and we really don't advocate for chemical controls uh, to be used, even if they were effective. Um, so we sort of mentioned this last in the what we call the hierarchy of harm. We think about which control measures can people take that have the least impact on the rest of the garden and the rest of the environment. Um, so, yeah, pruning is often number one and just picking the right point in the life cycle is really key um, and with this one the life cycle of the fungus will continue to be problematic throughout the winter uh, if the fruits as they become infected are al allowed to remain on the tree so it starts off as creating these sort of concentric rings um, of brown pustules and, and then the fungus will cause the fruit to shrivel and dry up and become really hardy but that will if that remains on the tree all winter long then that is a perfect source of the fungus to reinfect and cause a different phase of the disease, blossom wilt, um, in the springtime. And then you get the, the blossom spurs and the, and the new leaf spurs kind of drying up and curling up um, in, in, the, in the springtime. Um, yeah, again, wounds can also really ex accelerate the spread of this disease. So if you're trying to keep birds off of your, your trees, um, as, as impossible as that might seem, um, that could help you get the disease a bit more under control. Now, this is another really cool fungus. And actually this year, well, not peach leaf curl, but pocket plum, a similar taphrina fungus, um, it's just, it just seems to be plastering every blackthorn, every plum tree and uh, even ch cherry, a uh, relative uh, taphrina paddy, which infects bird cherries. It seems to be having a massive year. And we think that is because of the constant rain effectively that we've had um, this sort of winter and spring um, has just and you don't need that many spores around to, to start the epidemic. And then it really does. It does spread. What it does is it causes disfiguration in the leaves. And then with these relative fungi, the, the pocket plum, it can also infect the fruit and then it creates this white bloom of fungal spores, uh, which again can, can, can infect further tissues of the same plant. Um, because this is affecting the leaves and the fruit, uh, you know, trying to remove those during the autumn months is really key. Um, but it spreads by rain splash. As I said, the constant rain has been a big factor. And if you're trying to grow, for instance, lovely espalier um, trees in particular, they're much easier to cover. You can build a little winter rain cover that will reduce this um, in your peaches um, from really, you know, it, it can get quite a lot of good control by just stopping the rain from spreading it around. And there's some resistance. So something to look out for if you have had problems with this disease. Probably don't in, need to introduce Rose Black Spot to you, but what might be surprising is that it's in our top 10 because it's so well known and people are still asking questions about it. But I think a big part of the reason why is that these fungi used to be being controlled by fungicides and the public no longer want to use these things. They're no longer just reaching for the black spot spray. Something that we're saying is slowly getting through to people that just yeah, constantly applying fungicides to things isn't a good idea. Um, and they want to use more organic or you know cultural controls instead. Uh, but it isn't easy because it is everywhere and the resistance 
that is bred in by uh, our, our breeders only lasts for a few years and then eventually the pathogen seems to be able to overcome that. Um, and yeah, then you get you get all these different kinds of blotches on the stems and on the leaves. Um, and yeah, kind of hygiene and pruning it out is the best you can do. Uh, but we've got some research looking at alternative strategies to things do things like improve the structure of the leaf so that the pathogen has a harder time kind of penetrating those leaf tissues. Um, so watch this space. Maybe we will have some not so intense fungicide, but chemical inputs um, as a kind of micronutrient that may be able to reduce this problem in the future. Powdery mildew has, has been an absolutely enormous problem in gardens last year. Um, normally we have powdery mildews like as a keyword within our kind of data collection system for like all plants, but this made it to number three, despite it was only being the powdery mildew of Prunus laurus cerasus, um, cherry laurel hedges and Cherry laurel in particular is very noticeable, because it's very widely grown, but the symptoms are this yellowing and these shot holes that it produces, the, the fungus infects and then the plant drops the tissue out that has been infected, creating these holes, um, as well as having a white bloom of spores, usually on the underside of the leaves. Um, but powdery mildews, they were bad last year because of the enormous dry spell we had. So when plants are droughted, followed by a period of humidity, that's the perfect conditions for epidemics of powdery mildew to take off. So if you're struggling with powdery mildew, we recommend improving the airflow around the plant, not growing things tightly against walls and fences. Um, and But luckily, most of these are quite host specific. Um, so if you've got powdery mildew of your sage, it's not going to be the same that is infecting your cherry laurel, although some of them do, do cross over. Um, and again, whether people don't want to use fungicides, that's great, but we still might have other options, things like they call green chemicals that might help the plant kind of resist that early infection phase that might become available in the future. Um, and then number two wasn't a fungus, but number one in our top 10 is honey fungus. Um, so that's our malaria diseases. Um, as Lynn said, this is the focus really of my research at the RHS. Um, and it's such a huge problem because it is a lethal root rot fungus. So when it attacks those roots, the plant can't get enough water and doesn't transmit that up to the aerial parts of the plant. So you observe complete dieback above ground. But then the fungus, um, not just being satisfied with killing the plant, will continue to swap life cycles, uh, lifestyles and live as a saprotrophic fungus on the dead remains. And unless you remove all of that infected root system, you will still have a, a very rich source of the fungus that can infect anything else nearby that is susceptible. Um, so it's very problematic. It's very difficult to remove all of the roots of you know, big trees and you know, even hedges. They go quite deep, they go quite far. And yeah, even small pieces of woody fragments can survive for decades buried in the soil. And it might not need to grow out very far. It might be that you plant something else. And when those roots grow down towards the fungus, it's just been there waiting, slowly rotting that piece of wood down and it's able to quickly move into those roots and then slowly take over that plant. Um, but yeah, some of the signs you see are the white mycelial fans right down at the, usually in the roots themselves or at the base of the trunk. So peeling back the bark and then looking for these flat white mycelial fans. But you also might find the rhizomorphs that they produce. So these are complex fungal cords with a protective outer sheath. Um, and depending on the species of our malaria, um, can grow in extensive networks. The most pathogenic species, our malaria melia, isn't a big rhizomorph producer. Instead, it spreads preferentially or more successfully between root to root contact of a infected to a healthy plant. So spreading down privet hedges is its kind of like real kind of, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's quickest route to kind of get, get through your hedge. Um, it does produce mushrooms, um, but these are not a reliable sign. Um, and usually they'll only pop up once the plant is already dead or dying. Um, so to put those in perspective, um, yeah, these are the kind of ratios that we were seeing last year and honey fungus 
is number one and it's taken number one spot since we started collecting figures. So that's why we do a lot of research on it at the RHS. Um, whereas other cases, they, they, they will kind of mix around year by year as to which ones have the biggest impact and are usually based on the weather. Um, yeah, powdery mildew so high because of the hot, dry conditions. Um, but so I just wanted to quickly tell you about what some of our research findings are about honey fungus, about our malaria. Um, or, or it's more like what are our changing you know, narratives around it? And that is that our malaria melia, we do think of as a true pathogen, but we're trying to get people to change their thinking about our malaria gallica. This is an opportunistic pathogen. It prefers to just rot down dead wood um, and be a saprotroph. Um, and if you have it in your garden, we've got some experimental data that shows that Armillaria melia is less able to attack those plants and cause disease. So we wouldn't say to put it in your garden, but if it's already there and we can give you a confident um, diagnosis of which species you have, we would say just keep it in. Remove any plants that die as they die, but generally try and support your plant health. Um, but this is important to note that during drought, it will still act as a pathogen. So thinking if you're, if you're going to plant anything new and woody um, and you have honey fungus in your garden and you're not sure which species it is, or if you think it's Gallica even more so, to really consider which plants are you planting for your type of soil, for what the future climate might be like. So trying to think about the right plant in the right place and preventing stress, preventing those infections by having yeah, general better viability and health of those plants. Um, the host list of plants that can be affected by our malaria is huge and we have a host list at the RHS website but we've improved this in recent years because it was being biased by how popular plants were um, and we've changed our system of scoring susceptibility um, and some plants have moved up the list so we think that they're much more susceptible than we'd previously realized things like mahonia and parotia but then some things are very commonly grown we were seeing all the time but actually compared to how often it's grown they actually managed to escape disease quite a lot um, more than we thought so things like rosa and prunus have moved down our list um, and we're doing some further research into uh, whether, because these are just whole genera, right? Whether there's certain species or certain cultivars within these groups that actually might be quite resistant and that people that really love those plants, but they have our malaria in their gardens, could start planting these more resistant ones instead. We're doing some work at sort of using beneficial fungi in the roots of plants that have avoided being infected next to cases of honey fungus putting them into new kind of test plants and seeing whether they can withstand the disease experimentally. And we've got a couple of really nice um, isolates that are consistently showing this protective effect. Um, and it seems like some of the traits of these trichoderma fungi, endophytic fungi, is to do with controlling the pH of that rhizosphere. Uh, and we've got a few different enzymes that seem to correlate with their ability, as well as the, uh, presumably, in order to control the pH, the, their ability to produce ammonia. Um, but these fungi generally can stop honey fungus growth on, on wood and on, on agar plates. Um, but it's finding ones that have a really powerful in-planter effect that our research has been focusing on. And hopefully in, after one more round of PhD, uh, we might have something that we can even uh, put out as a product um, so people could buy shielded plants to try and replant in their obliterated uh, beds that have unfortunately had to be excavated from severe honey fungus infections. So yeah, I've only got a few minutes left now and we will move on, I'll have to skip a bit, um, onto the saprotrophic side of things. Um, but we really are emphasising that saprotrophic fungi in gardens are not just important for their own sake, but through Lynn Body's work, um, competing saprotrophic fungi with each other and with our malaria, she showed that our malaria is a very poor competitive for dead woody material. And so we want people, or well, we don't have the implant evidence to show the impact on disease yet. We're starting some research on this. Um, we want people to think about fungi as enriching their garden microbiome, like they enrich themselves with their probiotics and their kefir. We want people to start thinking about the fungal diversity in their gardens. And hopefully this will cause less disease issues with things like honey fungus and soil borne fungi in particular. Um, and I'll go through some steps that they can do to try and um, 
stack the odds in in the favour of of the good and away from things like honey fungus in the coming slide. But with that case of Gallica versus Melia, if they don't know what species they've got, they can't really make that decision um, on how to manage differently. So creating a rapid diagnostic test has been a priority for a while and uh, this work is commencing again after a bit of a break. So this is a sort of segue slide to kind of show you how these diseases within gardens have varied over time. Some of them are pretty constant so, and some of them will vary with the weather. But you'll notice last year and the year before that, um, sorry, 2021 and 2020, that bracket fungi is in that list at number six and number four. And now we have a big shift away from this because a bracket is, is a form. It's not a, a role of a fungus. And there are bracket fungi that are not actually pathogenic. They are just rotting down dead wood. And so seeing a fungus on a tree traditionally um, is something that is causes quite a great alarm to a lot of people. And we're trying to train people out of having that knee jerk reaction. And so we don't include bracket fungi as a pathogen. We've got new keywords and we've got quite a lot of changing uh, information, which is what I want to sort of spend the last couple of minutes just kind of whizzing you through. Because I'm sure you're all fully aware that most of the fungi in your gardens are beneficial be that from mycorrhiza, most of them will be saprotrophs, you'll also have lichens, and then the invisible but powerful endophytic and epiphytic fungi uh, that are really important in terms of their close collaboration with plants and helping them withstand stresses in the environment. But when people see mushrooms, um, again, I'm hopefully you don't come across these people, but we see it through the inquiry service at the RHS a lot, that they see a mushroom and their instant reaction and their assumptions are something along the lines of, is it honey fungus? Will it harm my garden? Is it poisonous? How do I get rid of it? How did it even get here? And horribly, how can I stop it from coming back? And so we really want to train them out of these horrible beliefs and kind of re-empower uh, them to see things in a different light. So we're trying to communicate that honey fungus is not the norm. Most mushrooms appearing in a garden are going to be from beneficial fungi. And so you will generally want to encourage it rather than get rid of it. They're mostly likely to be saprotrophic. Maybe they're ectomycorrhizal. That would be really nice if you had some of those in your garden, some very long established trees. But pretty much only honey fungus is, this, is a serious pathogen. So we're enabling people to identify things for themselves and to kind of, yeah, not see it as the norm that everything they see is going to be something horrible but also things like that no fungi are harmful to the touch is a real kind of mind-bending moment for a lot of people it's like people that have been in horticulture a long time are still unaware that just touching and handling a fungus can't do anything bad to them um, as we know as field mycologists even tasting and, and spitting like you know uh, poisonous fungi aren't going to harm you um, the idea that a lawn is a sacred place is slowly being eroded and the idea that mushrooms also belong in a lawn is again a, a message we really want to, to get over with people and even the nuisance fungi like the stinky ones seeing that they have an ecological role um, as beneficial um, is is quite a, a challenge to convince people of but um, and seeing the, the kind of the fascination in the different forms is something I think is we've got a better chance of selling that one. So we've got some new web profiles. Uh, if you do want to have a read, um, see, I'd, I'd be very welcome any comments you have, because, yeah, we've been consulting with people like Lynn um, in order to get our messaging right. Um, but the first one is all about saprotrophic fungi. And we're trying to communicate that these are recycling. And as they do that, they release lots of nutrition. They create habitats. They create forage in their fruit bodies and maybe even can keep pathogens in check. And we want people to celebrate and accept them rather than be fearful of them. Then the next big web profile we've released is all about heartwood fungi. Again, saying these are not pathogens. Heartwood is already dead wood. So these fungi that are living on that heartwood are creating hollows. They're not adding extra damage by damaging the sapwood, the living wood. It doesn't mean the tree is definitely going to be strong. It may weaken the structure of the tree depending on where it is and what age that tree is and whether it's premature aging or not. But looking at it a case by case scenario, thinking of these as part of the natural aging of trees is a big shift for gardeners, I think, to get on board with. Um, so I won't talk about mycorrhizae, but again, there's been a bit of a gold standard and we want people to think about encouraging things naturally rather than relying on products. 
Um, so again, I will leave these. These are our general messages, uh, which I think you've kind of probably got the idea of already. Um, but yeah, we're just trying to get these messages out through various interactive ways. So we have like a living exhibit at Wisley Garden. We're growing saprotrophic fungi and putting out signs to explain why they're good and labeling some of the existing fungi that we have around the garden, such as this Scanoderma here. Um, we also are now working towards educating people about what species they can and should be growing in their gardens if they want to, um, because it feels like the love of fungi and grow kits is racing ahead, but we really want to take a sort of ecological view of this and prevent people from just adding very far distant fungi into gardens and putting pressure on our local fungal populations wherever possible and kind of disentangling what is suitable for indoor growing and what if you're going to add saprotrophic fungi to your garden is suitable but we have to put pressure on the suppliers to grow local strains and to communicate those findings and so we're creating a web profile about where you can get your spawn from and hopefully this will nudge the uh, the market in the direction of more local production being carried out we also want people to appreciate them for their beauty and grow them in different ways there's always a neglected spot that will work in lots of gardens and i think that's why people are really taking this on board they can imagine it being incorporated into their planting scheme um, and this is some of the examples we have with wood chip beds made out of fungi logs, upright fungi logs supporting straw sacks full of oyster spawn and so on and so forth. And we've done some demonstrations as well as lots of press and things like the UK Fungus Day is a fantastic uh, operation. And we've jumped on board that bandwagon and carrying out family based activities um, as well as yeah, putting out as much positivity as possible. So. These are our general ways we tell people to support their fungi. Um, yeah, minimizing soil disturbance and, and avoiding where possible fungicides and fertilizers, as well as just appreciating them for their form and get, gr growing that love as not just a theoretical, but giving them something tangible that they can interact with. And that brings me to the end. Sorry, I still I think I stole a few more minutes than I should have done. Um, but yeah, like with the trees being affected by these incoming diseases that are spreading all over the world and that we don't know what we've got to it's gone. We also want to think about these fungi in our gardens, like if we're, we're starting the job to try and keep them around, we're trying to support our conserve our fungi. We're definitely not doing enough. But what else can we do? Because we don't know what we've got until it's gone. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'll hand back over to Lynn. Thanks ever so much, Jazzy. That's great. Maybe you could stop um, sharing your screen. Absolutely super talk. And, and thank you so much for, for all the myth busting that you're doing, the education at Wisley and uh, for pr pr promoting um, growing fungi or food from natural native sources. I think that's so important. You're doing some great work. Um, so we've got quite a few questions in the chat already. Um, maybe I'll work back through some of those uh, since um, we perhaps will, rem will remember the, the last things best. Uh, so, so one of the most recent questions was from Wim Peters, saying, uh, in respect of our malaria and, and removing um, soil, etc., uh, he asks, how can we be sure that we dig enough soil and hence remove our malaria melia? And then there's a follow-on from that. And Anyway, as honey fungus, if it's this bad, how can anything survive anyway? If you'd like to say a bit more about that. Can you repeat the first one? Was about, so it's about removing soil yeah. and roots? If, if, we, if we were removing soil to, to get rid of our malaria, Melia, how can we be sure that we've dug, dug out enough soil? Well, I'd say you, you can't, and that's sort of the problem. And the idea that you are going about removing it with that, the expectation that you can eradicate it from that spot is kind of false hope um, it's very likely to reoccur um, in that planting hole but also we still like we have it at RHS Wisley when they do spot treat they they just do whatever's practical so there'll be a certain level of root they will bother excavating to a case by case basis and over time they've sort of you know they've lost enough things every so often that they have a certain amount of effort that they'll put in and hope that it doesn't come back um, but we often advocate for once you have dug it out to leave the ground fallow for a year 
because small fragments of root or rhizomorph can regrow and infect something new if you put that straight in. And early establishing plants are the most vulnerable to attack. Um, but if you leave it for a year and you cultivate that soil repeatedly in that time, any regrowth will get kind of broken up into fragments and you'll be kind of killing it back every time. And then hopefully it will have a lesser, uh, lesser fungal load. Um, but yeah, you, the idea that we can eradicate it is is just uh, we need to kind of get out of that idea and yeah, try try planting things that seem to cope with it a bit better and treat them a bit better so that they are they've got their best defenses ready to you know try and keep the fungus out for themselves yeah yeah good answer um so two sort of related questions here one question is could local authorities um, be spread in disease when they collect garden waste well we advocate for most um so it's, it's difficult with woody disease um because we don't know much about what it takes to kill any fungus within that wood. But then also bear in mind that a lot of these wood-borne fungi require a fruit body to spread their spores and those spores will then infect new trees. So if it's just mycelium in wood, it's not that risky as a kind of source. Um, but And compared to how much healthy wood versus infected wood is in there, I think we don't really know. But when it comes to foliar things like apple scab, for instance, the temperatures that green waste uh, get to when you do massive commercial composting is high enough to kill those pathogens. So we wouldn't say home comp compost any of those things. But we often say it's fine to put into the green waste, although yeah, case by case, some fungi will say the best thing for it is landfill or burning it um, because it is too high a risk. Um, to even it probably will still manage to survive in, in commercial waste. Yes, and carry, carrying on from that, there's a, there's a question that should just come in asking about um, about when you've said about collecting litter. But the question is, but don't the fungi need the fallen leaves? Yeah. And again, it's 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 it's, it's hard to tell people like right now, I think encouraging collecting leaves is like a bigger win to kind of the, the traditional approach, which is collect everything, remove everything, clean everything up all the time. But ideally, we need the colour in that discussion, the nuance. So it's the, the plants where you have seen disease and you've observed it, remove those leaves. But most of the plants in your garden won't have something that, that is that bad unless everything's been completely splattered with powdery mildew. Um, most things, most of these leaves are going to be healthy leaves contributing to good leaf litter. And we want you to leave as much healthy plant based material in the garden in one form or another, even if you collect it and make leaf mould in one pile rather than just leaving the leaves everywhere. Any fallen wood, again, you might not just let it leave it where it lies, but we really don't want you to keep removing all of those resources and all of those microbes. So healthy stuff, keep it in. But if it is diseased, you're just going to create more and more disease problems unless you do tidy it up. Yeah, there's an interesting one here from Gary Easton. He says, I remember reading about a resistant GM American chestnut being produced using a wheat gene. Did yeah, I've read a bit about this. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's that there's there's like a group of chestnut enthusiasts that want to save the American chestnut. I think they've got some promising research that's coming up. Um, but yeah, it's a long way off. And as you know, trees take a very long time to grow. So even if they do get their their results, it'll be many decades before you start seeing even if it goes as perfectly as possibly could. But there's potential. So hopefully they will get ahead of the uh, that problem. Um, and things will go well for them. In Europe, the, tr the strategy we're kind of taking to try and control chestnut blight um, is using a virus, a mycovirus that basically attenuates the virulence of that pathogen. So it can't infect and sporulate and cause as much disease. It can still get in, but it just doesn't do that much. It's sort of the tree can tolerate it once it's been infected with this virus. And that's being deployed as a biocontrol in places where they grow lots of sweet chestnuts in Europe, like Italy. And would you like to expand a bit further on that and say why it isn't working, the, 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 vir the hypervirulence isn't really working in North America? Um, I'm not really sure. I think the problem with the, the fungi is that once, if I'm, if I'm right about this, but I'm, again, I'm trying to draw from my memories, is that once the, the fungus has the virus in it, it doesn't really spread. 
like mm. it's not sporulating and it's not like it's not traveling with the fungus so the pathogen can move but the virus isn't really moving around um so it only really works where we add it in and it's not out competing um you know in, in the ecosystem the, the pathogenic strains i think okay thanks um there's a, a, a sort of a an answer to or a comment on on the green waste composting um, as a professional landscaper i visit several green waste composters their plants are not biosecure many avenues of cross contamination so that's uh, one. yeah i'm not necessarily that surprised because i've heard so some of our work on rose black spot um, is is with people that have been working with nurseries growing these and some of the practices used commercially are all about you know mass production and efficiency of the, the sort of the trading system and getting the produce through which is kind of counter to taking things being very careful and being very hygienic and and yeah you because it slows things down a lot um but yeah in terms of um what's in what what kind of products they're producing and then putting out there i'd say depending on what the substance is will have a variable risk so we did do some research at the RHS before my time about woody mulches um, and whether you can add our malaria to gardens through these. But because it is on the surface level where it's added and it's in a very airy environment, that is not ideal for those fungi to grow. They get too dry. So they're not actually, we've got a very, very low rate of transmission downwards into the soil from that. So unless you're supplying woody mulch that you're going to bury into the soil, which then directly contact the roots where it could infect our malaria you're not likely to transmit through woody waste to, even if it's come from a, a very messy kind of um unbiosecure uh, green waste manufacturer um but yeah in terms of as long as the, the, the leaf is leaf mold and stuff like that is the green waste is getting composted thoroughly you know you, that those pathogens as i said should be eliminated so yeah it will vary pathogen by pathogen um the risk that you might end up with some in your garden but really with with woody fungi it's going to be coming in off of the spores um blown in the wind entering wounds that will be we think the most important route for spreading around thank you um a few rust questions now um so this one says i i have a rust fungus that grows on my willow it's orangey bronze an orangey bronze powder on the leaves what exactly is it and is it harmful at all? I try to clean it off as I don't know what it is and try to play it safe. I've never come across a rust on a willow. Um, I don't, and I, so I, especially not on the leaves of a, of a willow. Um, so I, I really couldn't say, I'm afraid. Um, but it, it's important to note that other orange things do appear on trees, things like algae. Um, can look like a lot like rust um, and the colour orange makes us think rust but it's not always a rust and it, that, for it to know whether it is or isn't a pathogen it would be growing into and through the leaf and bursting out one side of the leaf with lots of spores and if you have a microscope you could even take a look at those spores but um, yeah in terms of any disease problems RHS members can send in photos and we will do our best to identify them um, but likewise, even if you're not a member, you can Google our, our web profiles, RHS and then whatever disease you think it is. And we generally there's got really great resources um, for identifying and managing some of these problems with even without having to be a member of the RHS. So, um, yes, take a look at that. But uh, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with willow rust personally, I'm afraid. OK, then we'll try you on pear rust. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, you you talked about pear rust earlier and you talked about um juniper as being the alternate host so there's a question is the alternate host juniper as communist communist oh, i didn't mean to say communist there um communist um and and the, the follow-on from that is um are there some conservation priorities in the uk with regard to juniper um i'm afraid i don't know on, on either front um i think i think it is yes ju uh, like a juniper communists um but whether there's other junipers whether it's more broad than ju just communists i don't i don't know um and yeah I, I imagine that there are um particularly in certain parts of the country um but in terms of where most of our rhs members are based down in the southeast i don't think there are but i think maybe around like the highlands um but i'm not sure i'm afraid 
Oh, there's a, a comeback on the rust on Willow here from um, from David Lonsdale, who says that there's several rusts on Willow, for example, Melampsbora epitaea. Yeah, and Faye's also chipped in. So Faye, oh, yes. Faye's like really, she knows a lot about rusts um, and she's one of our advisors at the RHS. Um, and yes, so she also confirms. So you probably do have Willow rust, um, whoever that was. Sorry. OK, that's good. Thank you. You're doing very well on, on these rather tricky questions. I have to say, I'm glad it's not me trying to answer them. I'm just going to go right back to the, the very first question that came in right at the beginning of the talk. Um, Bruno Lambrecht from Belgium um, asks about sequoia dendron um, and, and whether there are any particular fungal infections in Britain. There, apparently there are a lot of dying sequoia dendrons in Belgium. Hmm. See, the, my, my only no knowledge of sequoia dendron comes from the honey fungus host list. Um, where yeah, sequoias and metasequoias, they tend to be quite unhappy, I think, where they're grown in the UK. And uh, so they they come up as catch, getting honey fungus a disproportionately large amount of the time. Um, but I think that they're not often being grown in, in, in the environments that they would prefer. So it's kind of stress factors that are leading to them to, to being attacked by things. Um, but yeah, off the top of my head, I, there's nothing that stands out to me as being like, really threatening them. Um, but they're also, they're not widely grown um, that I'm aware of. So yeah, it's something that I think like people with a neat, more niche interest in those trees would be able to answer better than me from my kind of broad awareness of them uh, through yeah, the advisory service. Yes, and, and that David Lonsdale mentions in the chat that it can be affected by honey yeah. fungus. I'm just, throw, I'm just trying to throw in as many as I can in the last three minutes here. Yeah. Um, someone asked, can we put a link in the chat for IDing notifiable tree diseases for actually ID. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. certainly. So yeah, the um, so there's in terms of how to identify yourself, there's um, a, so there's another citizen science program called Observatory, which is a, like a network of trained volunteers that are kind of spread out around the country, and they report back on sort of high risk and suitable for citizen science reporting pests and diseases of trees. But the observatory resources for identification are brilliant. And I would say that's a really good first port, port of call for carrying out your, your own identification. But if you've found something and you've done a bit of Googling and you think, yeah, this is actually something notifiable potentially and you want to report it, um, Tree Alert, um, is that the one there, is the platform to do that. So I've got that there. Let's put that in there. Um, so that hopefully takes you to Tree Alert. It's not an app, but it now is suitable for smartphones in your browser. Um, the best way to submit records is to create an account because then you can get reports back from like feedback from what your records have said. And you can look back at ones that you've done in the past rather than doing it as a guest every time. And if you are on the lookout, like maybe you're like, OK, you know, um, maybe I'm not into sweet chestnuts, maybe you're into oaks um, and you you want to go and report healthy oaks, you can report healthy trees, any healthy tree, as well as ones with these notifiable pests and diseases on them as well. Um, so if I look, if I get observatory up as well. Uh, so that that's the one for sweet chestnut blight here. And actually through that Chicka Sweet Chestnut website, there's all these links in there as well. Um, so, yeah, I can put that in the chat as, if you like, because that's got a, a massive, um, uh, what to call it, a uh, list um, of, of links that, uh, yeah, you, if you're interested in helping to pitch in and protect tree health, um, yeah, that's a really good kind of landing page to then seek out your, your further interests. OK, maybe we've got chance. One last little bit of question. Um, is there evidence of epidemics in the wild, in inverted commas, or are they always the result of human interventions such as travel and trade and monocultures? Ah, OK, so it's, it's in like, do do pests and pathogens just emerge without being introduced? I think you're asking. And yes, they do. Um, or 
things that weren't really much of a problem can suddenly start becoming a problem. And actually Peros is one of those. Like we've had it for ages, it's it's native and you know it's it's been here for a long time. It hasn't come from anywhere, but suddenly in the last few years it's just been getting everywhere. Although as you say, we don't really think of it as a as a problematic disease as such. But pathogens are uh, also capable of jumping between hosts. So I think there's been some downy mildews that have jumped from one host to another. And in one host, it wasn't that bad, but then it enables it, you know, it evolves, I guess. And with those new uh, kind of pathogenicity genes, those tools, molecular tools, uh, it causes much bigger problems in another host. I can't think of any good examples at the moment. Maybe aquilegia downy mildew, they think. Um, so aquilegia is a herbaceous, like flowering plant. They think that that is likely to have arisen not from arriving from elsewhere but jumping from another host where it wasn't that big a deal um, but now it's yeah really quite severe on, on aquilegias um, and aquilegias are quite important for other organisms within the ecosystem so it's quite a sad case. Mm, on, on that note I really think we have to stop I think we could have probably gone on for, for very much longer and there are still more questions coming in and more at the beginning of the chat too but there have been several comments uh, in the chat saying thank you for a, a, an absolutely inspiring talk and I would really second that it has been an inspirational talk and and uh, you, you've answered the questions brilliantly and given us all sorts of uh, additional insights so thank you very much for a, a splendid talk and a very splendid evening um, thanks for the BMS for putting this talk on and indeed thank you so much for the audience as well for uh, posing such very good questions and we hope that we will see you again in the not too distant future thank you everybody Good night. Thank you. Bye.